Welcome, joining us for the Exposition Imaginaire in Vienna this afternoon. You are, uh, you are uh, based in Berlin. Um, maybe we should talk about this as well, why you are based in Berlin, but not working in, necessarily in Berlin. Uh, you moved to... Natasha is a very well-known curator already, and she's just, in your case, I think I need to tell your age. You are just 30 years old, and if I look into your biography, I'm highly impressed. Um, yeah, you are... Um, above all uh, projects uh, you were leading and are leading at the very moment, uh, you, you work globally as an independent curator, researcher, and writer. Um, you were a part of the um, uh, or assistant curator or co-curator for the uh, last Berlin Biennial, uh, working together with Juan Gaetan. Uh, you are the one of the uh, curatorial advisors recently for the for the for the upcoming uh, uh, documenta. Uh, uh, taking place in Athens and in Kassel. Uh, as far as I know, you're not the only uh, uh, associate uh, curator, um, but it's, it, to me, maybe to be a little bit provocative, it looks a little bit like geopolitical uh, 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 strategy from Adam Chimczyk, who is the artistic director, that he really spread his agents or co-curators or curatorial advisors, advisors around the world. Uh, and above all of this, you are uh, the curator, artistic director for the uh, upcoming uh, Contour Biennial. Uh, it's a biennial for moving uh, uh, images in Belgium, in the Flemish uh, part of Belgium, in the city of Mechelen. Um, that lead, would lead me already to the very first uh, question. Um, a moving, you know, uh, moving images, a biennial, you know, now uh, where we can see almost watch everything online. Uh, does this, uh, first of all, why is it, is it this kind of very uh, hermetic kind of biennial where you have to choose moving images, and uh, why does this format need needs a biennial? And why in Mechelen, as in the middle of uh, Belgium? Or maybe just introduce the project, and why did you accept uh, this? Um, Bayano, being the curator, artistic director of this. Great. Thank you so much for this invitation. I've been watching previous talk as well, and it was very interesting. Thank you so very much. It's great to come at the end of um, the closing weekend. I know you have Dieter next, but um, there's been already so much content and discussion through this project. Um, now for my project, i describe Mechelen. Uh, it's a very special event. And uh, the paradigm of moving image work is, I don't see it as a limitation. In fact, each edition of this Biennale has uh, provoked a new reading and an extension of uh, genre and medium. So, for instance, when um, Mechelen uh, the Biennale in Mechelen launched in 2003, there were only 15 artists, and most of them were from the Netherlands and from Belgium. And it was quite unique to um, have this kind of exhibition scale for video art at the time. But after this, there was uh, Navhak and um, uh, Katarina Gregos and several uh, very well curated editions that focused on um, sound, uh, that focused on regimes of discipline and punishment, I mean, conceptually as well as uh, through medium relations. I feel that the Contour Biennale has, in fact, incredibly uh, re-innovated itself. And it's not about only one genre. It expanded a little bit. Well, there is a focus on the moving image, but um, it isn't exclusive. It has not been. Um, there have, despite this, there have been uh, very important commissions to moving image-based artists, whether that's uh, 
you know, Hijo Style or Hassan Khan, Anri Sala, uh, Shantal Akraman. There's been very important work been staged there, but it's always been surrounded um, with various other mediums. And for me, um, it's a time to think about how moving image work within, as you're talking about, the digital landscape um, also needs to be rethought. And uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, the concept as well, mm -hmm. in terms of um, how I'm reading the, the terrain of Belgium at this point, also through the realities of Europe that are kind of commonly facing us. But you know this uh, region quite well. You studied uh, at the Diapel Curatorial Course uh, 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 a couple of years ago and you, uh, in Amsterdam. You know this region very well. Yeah, so then I'm... Yeah, in fact, uh, the Netherlands is where I first moved to um, from India and I, I've, I still have very close relations with institutions in the Netherlands. And so Belgium, in a sense, has been uh, an extension of those for me. And uh, I've been working already on the Biennale uh, since last year, uh, summer. I knew about my appointment. So we've made quite a lot of ex uh, advancements and held events in Brussels as well. So, um, yeah. So the Contour Biennale 8 will look into the legal and judicial legacy um, of the lowlands. Because Mechelen, and some might not know this, had what was called the Great Council, which was the largest uh, court that made legal decisions uh, for Dutch, French, and German territories. So what we're looking at is the remnants of Europe's first courthouse that addressed regional concerns. And of course, now when we look at the Brexit and this sort of breaking up of certain ideals, um, it seems an important moment to think of how artists consider um, the space of the law, um, questions of evidence um, and testimony, uh, technologies of witnessing and the trial. So these are some of the things that I've been uh, looking at with the artists that I've already invited to control. Do, do, do you, th uh, okay, that, let's, um, that, if I understand you right, you don't look at it from the technology aspect. Uh, uh, you're more looking into how profoundly uh, this uh, technology is shaping our contemporary world and shaping our contemporary thinking and uh, shaping the new production of art. Is that right? To some extent, yes. Uh, I'm also interested, though, in the historical uh, condition of Mechelen, as I said, through this the remnants of this court that addressed mm -hmm. Europe as a region um, in, from the 15th century. So in a sense, I'm evoking, let's say, a ghost to talk about how to address questions of social justice. And um, the techniques of the moving image, of course, are at the center of that. But uh, does it mean you are looking more into the Eurocore uh, area, how Rem Kohlhaas calls it? Mm -hmm. Or will yeah. it be a global biennial? It's going to be a global biennial. I mean, I, it's the first time that they have uh, a, a non-European curator. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't want to be the one to sort of narrow the scope um, of it in terms of the artists. But um, you know, I visited uh, 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 Contour uh, uh, many times, but I'm, and I know that the marketing behind Contour, it's very, it's huge. Uh, uh, in the t time, in times when the biennial is happening, uh, uh, and before and also afterwards, but I was always a little bit missing uh, that uh, I couldn't. Uh, but it's so uh, a moving images biennial is very time consuming, and it's always when you go in a city, when you have to uh, go into several, uh, uh, see it in, in several locations, it's always looking a little bit for e picking Eastern acts and. Uh, it's very time consuming and you could not, uh, will, you in, will you be also responsible on putting it a little bit more really digital for people who are not able to visit mm -hmm. the Bayano? Um, could I request at this point to maybe just uh, put up our website? Yes, please. Thank you. So when we launched the new website for Contour, in this edition, we 
also launched an online journal as um, various other uh, forums for the arts are doing. So I'm, I, I know very well that I'm not the only one doing this. Um, but it became quite important precisely because you also uh, mentioned the fact that with moving image, it requires a lot of time. And then how do we consider the Biennale already launching with these artistic voices prior to the exhibition body itself? So we decided that each month we're going to launch two entries that in some ways speak to each other. And these will include writers, filmmakers, theorists. Um, the first that you see here uh, is Inhabitants, which is a project uh, by Pedro Neves Marquez and Mariana Silva. It is in fact a channel for radio and documentary reporting. So it exists on the web and is seen through um, major streaming channels like YouTube, Vimeo, and the Inhabitants website. And these two, um, they've been looking into current planetary narratives, systemic imbalance, questions of the Anthropocene. Um, also, one of the episodes dealt with geoengineering um, and a campaign um, called Wages for Facebook. So there is a lot uh, here in relation to um, inquiring to technologies of the moving image and its representational value. So Image Notes is, in a sense, a prelude to the episodes that inhabitants will launch uh, on their uh, fork on tour. So it will only exist as an online project for the Biennale. So it can be visited, in a sense, through a virtual audience. So that, I think, is already one way of answering your question. And um, the second entry, um, if you could just, if, it, if someone could click on the second entry so that we scroll down. That, thank you. Um, that's Elizabeth Pavanelli has written up um, a letter in, in the form of essay um, for the Karabing um, Film Collective, who are an indigenous media corporation based in Darwin in Northern Territory, Australia. And they work as a horizontal uh, collective decision-making body who have gone into filmmaking as a practice to address certain land claims, legal concerns um, around their ancestral territories, um, grappling with the reality of mining uh, corporations. And so this letter, in a sense, frames itself also within, um, with excerpts of the films. So for me, it becomes a strategy to view and uh, to read at the same time. And in this sense, uh, the online journal becomes an animated space. Why are you operating from Berlin, then? So, well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know? I think many of us are, aren't you as well, in part? Yes, so, but it's... Uh, <laughs> oh, God, that's this argument which makes you all right. No, but uh, you are, you know, no, you're... I can, uh, well, I think Berlin yeah. comes into our lives at some stage and you decide how long you want to stay, right? So mm -hmm. I was invited by Juan uh, to join the artistic team of the Berlin Biennale. Mm -hmm. And this happened at a very early stage uh, after his appointment. And so mm -hmm. I, I sort of became part of the process and felt it was a gift to get to know the artistic scene here um, while conceiving the Biennale together. And we were also using this very sp uh, special uh, part of Berlin to stage um, the, the Biennale Dahlem as well as Mitte. So I learned a lot and I felt that this city has become very important to me. Hmm. And it, it functions very well to be going to Belgium and, and, and working for Documenta as well and other projects from here. Uh I did, we did it already at a, uh, in an earlier conversation uh, with Christian Ratzemeyer. We were talking because we, bo we are both visiting the, uh, b um, the this year's edition of the Berlin Biennial, and I was wondering how how you, as one of the curators who has been responsible for the last edition of the Berlin Biennial, how do you see the this year's edition, uh, the present in drag of the uh, the discollective. 
Um, there was a lot of crit criticism about the biennial. We know, we know about this. Um, uh, and what my critique is mainly about, it's not about the format, and it's not about the locations, and not about the, the style of uh, the, the chosen art. It's more that it really looks uh, made up by middle-class white men and women from North America and uh, uh, Berlin. Uh, but how do you look at it? Uh, so it's, a, it's kind of a technology, uh, it's, a, it's a biennial about technology, post-internet and technology. Um, and uh, yeah, do you have, with the this uh, strategy, do you have something in common with their thinking, or how do you look at it at this biennial? Okay, um, I'm going to try and keep my answer quite balanced. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. The fact is that it's quite difficult, I think, once you've been part of the creation of one edition, to fairly comment on the very next one. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. No, no, I'm, I'm aware of this, and it's, uh, uh, and it's not that uh, I'm not asking for uh, an, uh, more thinking about it or uh, 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 reviewing it from a uh, uh, um, general perspective, how, how do you uh, uh, look at it? Is it, uh, is it for you an important research tool or...? Uh... I feel like one of the things that are very clear to me is that they've genuinely staged their concerns in really interesting ways. So mm. whether we um, are, let's say, um, attracted or feel related to of a wide range of the artworks. This is a separate question, but when I enter, say, the KW or um, the, um, the Academy de Kunst, I can sense that the materiality of this BNR is being true to, um, let's say, the, the kind of curatorial model. This is one thing. Um, further to this, I, I, I think some critiques on um, the selection of artistic works and all of this have uh, come in very rapidly and so it would be good to see what happens with time when Berlin lives with this Biennale mm -hmm. a little bit. How do you be, you know, looking to, uh, it's a complicated uh, term, but genera generation, and you belong to this so-called generation of post-internet art. How do you relate to it? Stepping a little bit aside from the Berlin Biennale. Well, there are a lot of online resources that are vital to my thinking. And so, as, as the example of setting up this journal or, or using a lot of web-based tools for, for my curatorial work, I, mm -hmm. I definitely feel an affinity for this. Um, I'm not shy of learning and grappling with new technology and its questions. However, I'm also a, a sort of worm mm -hmm. of the archive. I, I, I love exploring um, paper archives and I've sort of been into the city archive in Berlin and I've explored the, um, you know, the kind of store rooms of Dahlen, the Ethnological Museum. So I also prefer in a sense, to keep that uh, strategy of uh, moving into historical spaces um, and, and archival uh, and historical museums, and, and yet at the same time not letting go of the technological possibilities in, in our curating sort of realm. Hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, it leads me also a little bit to, to, my, um, to my next question. Is it common in our... Yeah, we can call it global situation, that exhibitions are often only witnessed via other means than just visiting the physical space, just as our talk here now. Um, how do you view this uh, development in terms of looking to future models of the exhibition? Um, and in, maybe in relationship to this, we can also talk about your project Museum of Rhythm you curated in 2012 in, uh, at the Taipei uh, Biennial. You know, but researching this, I think this was also a very good uh, model of, and on, I have to be honest, I think really about your generation, you know, or at least coming from your generation. 
Um, thanks. What if um, we actually first look at um, the super community website? Because okay. I'd like to draw on that a little bit as well. Yes. So um, last year, I was um, also engaging with this great platform that I um, that Eflux launched during the Venice Biennale. And, and most of you probably know Super Community. So uh, I felt that this, uh, the various steps involved in uh, Super Community also sort of sh uh, reshaped my thinking around how to model the exhibition after uh, being an editor for various texts. So what happened is at first, um, I started to uh, guest edit the series on corruption within super community. So we had, um, as you see, there are several uh, writings that were periodically launched. There was a text every day, but um, for us, it, it sort of came um, in, a, in a different rhythm. The te it was not a review every day, it was a text published, yeah. which was written beforehand and then published every day. Hmm? Yeah, so when the, uh, there were uh, sub-themes within Super Community, and each theme was edited by um, an invited guest and also supported by the Eflux editorial team. And so my strand from that was uh, on corruption, which is a, a term that I am fascinated with. And so while unraveling uh, notions around corruption, I commissioned various artists, um, an anthropologist, philosophers, um, to to consider the term and its application uh, within political and cultural systems. But what came later was the exhibition. So there was this question of if this online platform is active in the world, what are we doing making an exhibition for it at ITLA? So in, in a sense, it had these uh, two levels, one of remaining online where people can still access it freely and the next was uh, when the texts were um, turned into objects and maps and other forms of um, artistic works uh, in, in, with, with segments of uh, the text. So you mm -hmm. have objects and text exhibits and artist works within the exhibition and you can constantly refer back to the online platform. So I found that just uh, for me, an, a new language in which to uh, propose an exhibition. And it's in, you know, the term corruption uh, appears in the digital age quite a lot because through in this hyper -capital, uh, capitalistic times, uh, uh, because of the digital age, corruption, corruption is growing. Not necessarily, or I'm, I, I, I'm not aware that this is really the case in our, our hemisphere, in the arts. Uh, System, but as such, it is definitely. And it's uh, have you ed because it was an online uh, 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 part of the biennial. Uh, was that one of the your topics as well, or not? Sorry, Co corruption as corruption or corruption. What what was the? I'm, I'm more interested about the subtext. What what which kind of corruption? Mm -hmm. yes. Digital. Yeah. We went from the digital to the botanical to the corporeal, so also political poisonings. So for instance, Julieta Aranda looked at uh, poisoning in, in, in sort of political and historical terms. She looked at um, Litvinenko, and mm. she looked at uh, the Radium Girls, you know, these sort of historical cases of, mm -hmm. uh, of poisoning. Um, Charles Stankiewicz looked at um, the biography of chemicals and, and mm -hmm. uh, poisoning within chemical terms. Hu Fang looked at the botanical and uh, corruption and plant life. So we really went in different directions with this. Who was visiting the website? Do you have any idea about the, uh, how that shaped uh, the biennial and the, the, the re reception of the last Venice Biennial, your project? I mean, it's an efflux project. I so know. I many of us involved, and there mm -hmm. was also a big um, a sort of notice board, you could call it, which mm -hmm. was a sort of large sculpture that had um, part of the text for the day. Um, exhibited right in front of the Giardini. So it had a physical component at the Venice Biennale as well as the online component. 
Yeah, my, my question is more, does the, uh, uh, why was the Venice Biennale necessary for launching and for doing this project, the physical space? I feel like it's, uh, as an international platform that wished to bring and think about all the world's futures, I feel like this was very significant in mm -hmm. terms of um, the sort of thinking that launched every single day. Mm -hmm. And if you go uh, from this, when did you get invited for, for uh, being one of the Documenta uh, uh, curate, associate curators? And at, at which moment and why? Do you... um, well, why? Um, I'm, I don't know if, if I should, I'm the right person to ask why I got invited. Um, well, one thing is that. Adam um, Shemshek and I, we made quite a few trips to India, mm -hmm. so to Bangladesh. And this took place quite early on um, after his appointment. Mm -hmm. He became interested in South Asia, its, its histories, and also the current um, artistic uh, you know, groups that are working there. So in this sense, the research began. and. Um, I officially uh, got invited when there was an expansion of our team. We also had the uh, public programs curator, um, other curatorial advisor, and um, curator at large. Venture. Several people joined at the same time, and this was um, also before the 60 years sort of marking, um, and we've been working together since then. Now it's also, you know, it's an ongoing thought already for, for 20 years, how to expand uh, the thinking about documenta, uh, which has a lot to do with belonging and longing for. And, uh, but for you, being, you know, being living or coming from India, moving uh, uh, to Europe, what are your thoughts about the notion of the national uh, representation and the belonging in the digital age? Mm -hmm. And this then translating into uh, digital projects uh, in which you have been involved a lot. Hmm? Um, maybe it, because it's uh, obviously too early to speak um, further about document at this point. No, no, we don't need to. I would like to mm -hmm. refer to the Venice Biennale project, which mm -hmm. in fact queries into the, the representation of nationhood and um, for the very first time brought together India and Pakistan at the Venice Biennale. In 2012? Uh, no, this was uh, so last year. I don't know about this. So this was uh, My East is Your Best. It was also within um, All the World's Futures, uh, Oakland Wizards Biennale, and I felt that it was very meaningful for us to be part of his edition. Mm -hmm inquiring into uh, the fractures of our times and how conditions of nationalism um, create ruptures within, um, that, that provoke us to rethink um, representing nations at Venice. So, I, sorry. Could you could you a little bit tell about where was that situated? Because not, I don't think that all all people who are here in our at our audience and look at us, uh, at, us at YouTube later, where was that exactly situated and which pavilion? Sure. So this it? was at Palazzo Benzon, um, yeah. uh, near um, San Marco, and it's along the Grand Canal. So we used uh, this palazzo as we were an independent project essentially. Uh, working with a Delhi-based foundation called the Gujral Foundation. Mm -hmm. And um, the government would obviously never support a combined project between India and Pakistan. So in a sense, it's already a fantasy mm -hmm. that we uh, wish to claim. So here we brought together um, Rashid Rana uh, from Lahore and Shilpa Gupta from Mumbai within the project My East is Your West. And um, I think, in a sense, thought through um, regional realities, I also created a public program um, that traveled across South Asia. So another sort of mm -hmm. programming platform that did what is otherwise impossible geopolitically 
traversing as one program, uh, as one cultural program within um, the no. region. Yeah, yeah, of course, uniting uh, these two conflicting nations, Pakistan and India. Uh, how did that project in Venice translate to, back to, to India and to Pakistan? Or to the art, let's see, to the art scene? Sure. In those. If we go back um, to the work of Rashid Rana, where we have this, um, yeah, thanks, that one. Within this project, Transpositions, uh, Rashid created this actually a sort of live stream on a major scale where it is um, brought together with installation architecture. What you have is um, within the Palazzo Benzon room that is a 17th century um, palazzo, uh, quite decorative, you have this huge floor to seat screen in which you see um, people from Pakistan, from Lahore, who are standing in exactly the same room as you. So in a sense, half of the room is made a screen. At the very uh, moment. At the same moment, yeah. and you can talk to each other. OK. So our visitors in Venice are connected to the people of Lahore, who are um, actually situated in an installation that has made a sort of uh, mimetic exact sort of uh, dimensions relation to the room in the palazzo. Mm -hmm. And they are entering through uh, a public market area into this white cube that has this uh, mirage uh, of the architecture in Venice. And you're, you are able to establish a relationship in real time with each other. So in this project, I feel, also expands ideas of the exhibition as something being in two places at one moment, at ways in which uh, Venice reaches out quite literally to, uh, to the Lahore audience. And the, and the people were communicating or not? On that image here, it more looks like that they are looking at each other, but not communicating. But were, were they communicating? There were moments where I have to say I felt that, in fact, people in Venice were a bit more um, sort of wary. They weren't as sort of open and friendly initially. They were trying to understand what was going on. Um, and those in Lahore were, uh, you know, playing tricks and, and talking and very excited and the you know, even people singing and, and, and really feeling that, okay, there, there, there's this possibility that uh, you're transmitted. And, and uh, it became, I mean, it created quite emotional moments as well. But there was this initial quite cold reaction of, is this a screen or is this really a group that I can talk to. Could you have done such a project also the, the other way around? In India and then translating it uh, to, uh, as a city, the physical, uh, yeah, just the other way around, that the, turning the communication process around. Could that have been possible or not for you? Um, you mean between India and Pakistan? No, Venice and, no, yeah. yeah sure. It could be done. Um, but this was an idea that came from Rashid um, very much. And, and I think, you know, there are of course, such a lot of political challenges right now in Pakistan. It isn't as easy to, uh, to leave and to comprehend the, the, the complexity of climate there. So for us, this became a link to, to look at, you know, the individual um, within this society. And um, I, I think it was, in that sense, quite special. But Shilpa Gupta worked very differently. And um, she, in fact, chose to look at the borderlands of India and Bangladesh and this um, mm -hmm. porous border, uh, which will now have the world's longest fenced barrier. And she looked at how um, goods and um, people uh, kind of crossed between this borderline. And, and try, try to tell stories and map that uh, that process. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I, it's more, of course, thinking from a European perspective, and uh, situated in Europe, have never lived in this uh, region, uh, 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 and thinking about the conflict of uh, between India and Pakistan, of course. In a recent Skype conversation, uh, uh, when. I did a little bit of research about, what, uh, about your lecture, recent lectures and presentation. It was quite striking, very interesting for me when, when you sat 
the exhibition itself as an animated space in which various forms of knowledge can be brought forth. How do you view the current tendency of the physical exhibition space to be supported, supplemented, with a digital rendering reproduction? Is that in this way, you, what, what, in this, what do you mean in this way by uh, animated space? Also thinking again, for me, it's, uh, I'm wondering, thinking back to the contour by Yenel, uh, does the exhibition need to be an animated space? Um, well, I think uh, exhibitions, exhibition formats challenge this question of temporality um, in, each, uh, in each formulation. So, for me, um, the Contour Biennale is going to have multiple temporalities and in terms of moving image, um, but also in the surround of this historic architecture that it takes place in. So when I talk about this question of the animation of the space, it's, it doesn't directly correspond to technology, but maybe more in terms of, uh, it's a question of imagination and scripting um, across space. And maybe um, this is also a good time to come back to the Museum of Rhythm, since you'd mm -hmm. asked me about that earlier. Um, since we could open that website, the Museum of Rhythm. I think, no, this is the Berlin Vienna. Yes. Great. Right. So um, the Museum of Rhythm, in a sense, I, sits quite well with your um, current formulation of the idea of the imaginary museum. Um, since it is a speculative museum, it exists only when um, I sort of manifest it in a place, and otherwise it turns into an imaginary kind of space as well. Um, this was first realized at the Taipei Biennale um, on the invitation of Ansem Franke in 2012. And the entire Biennale was composed of imagined museums. Um, so that's interesting. So this was just one among other museums made by artists and uh, made by, by other curators. And I decided to pursue um, Henry Lefebvre's ideas on rhythm analysis, since um, he proposed the, this idea, but it came towards the end of his life, and it felt that rhythm analysis could be incorporated as a strategy to consider um, this fictive museum that tries to reconsider how um, modernity can be in, uh, visited through the inscription of rhythm. And so you have um, the kind of machinic time, organic time. You have um, engineering drawings um, and films, time space, uh, sorry, time motion studies. Um, you have also artists working with notation and um, the sort of ways in which uh, the regime of rhythm sets itself um, into the human body at times in coercive ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that this model as well of exhibition making for me was, uh, it was facilitated by, let's say, um, archival technology quite significantly. Um, because I was looking at um, the sort of Cornell archive of labor studies, uh, I was also looking at the Theosophical uh, Society books uh, from the 19th century. Um, I was looking at Chinese uh, watercolors that look at labor. Um, th so there was a lot of uh, historical work that I needed to access uh, and rematerialize within the Museum of Rhythm. Unfortunately, I haven't seen the Bayano. That's, um, you know. Exactly. Can you go a little bit down? And if you go on the website, what, what do... There's also maybe some images. If you, if you go to the left. Um, but I, I, can, um, I can say that... So, for instance, there was um, a project by uh, Eric Beltran, um, who's an artist, working on maps that have a sentient function. So maps that are tactile, for instance. 
that need to be touched uh, mm -hmm. uh, to read time. So they become devices of timekeeping, also of cartography. And uh, so here, rhythm um, remains inscribed in maps that are sculptural as well. Um, that was one work. Um, there's also, we looked at uh, experimental film through artists such as Ken Jacobs, who uh, treated the film surface to um, sort of kinetic procedures. And so you have um, the, yeah, his film here, which uh, completely retranslates through projection um, the um, um, a Laurel and Hardy classic, turning it into um, a sort of um, throbbing uh, light experiment as well. Um, and we had Shana Horvitz, Hannah Boven, Gerhard Room, um, Simon Corti, working with uh, choreography, uh, working with notation, mm -hmm. uh, linearity, um, and, and, and sort of all of these notions that uh, turn rhythm into um, concepts of, of artistic time as well. Going back to uh, where we started, to contour, Back to Mechelen, it opens uh, next spring, is that right? The end of March. The end of March, also shortly before, it's a very good moment, uh, shortly before Documenta in Athens. Uh, what I'm, I don't want to ask what we, uh, what we, what, 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 what we will, uh, what we will see, but what do you expect as, uh, what, what is the surplus value you want to get out of it with this Bayano? for you, for yourself, and for all of us? Um, I, for me, it's been, one has been really important to um, spend a lot of time with the artists that I'm engaging with. So what's been great for me is that this Biennale will not have more than 25 artists. Mm -hmm. So that means that what we're doing is creating a community. And I mean that quite seriously, because the artists do spend a lot of time with each other, mm -hmm. and they, they publish, um, are going to be other public talks before the Biennale. So for me, it's it's uh, really a, a strategic move after working in larger structures to, to consider this intimacy and um, really take on certain um, urgent questions of how uh, justice operates um, for for us in, in, in sort of this kind of, in a sense, a time of collapse. Um, and, and I feel like... Uh, Collapse of what? Oh, yeah, collapse of sensibility. I mean, you mm. know, we, we all know what's going on. And I just think that by using this historic structure as well that existed in Mechelen, as I said, the idea of this great council that sort of mm. sat and, and created um, a, sort of a social space for justice, mm -hmm. how to challenge that through um, the questions of, of, of racism, of hypernationalism. Um, Mm. No, I, I, I totally agree with you, but I'm uh, also reading earlier today uh, uh, um, uh, Guardian online, and it was, there was one very interesting uh, remark uh, in an interview. Someone said, okay, there will be held a lot of exhibitions and in, the, in the next year, a lot of exhibitions, not necessarily art exhibitions, exhibitions and symposia and other conferences around the world, but nothing will change. Because, you know, because people are, are, are just not part of these discussions, you know, and not, not uh, for, for, for me being a director, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge, you know, a director of an institution which is also only reaching out to a, to a limited uh, 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 number of people, uh, um, uh, which that's a problem what we face. Uh, 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 everywhere, yeah, this is highly politicized uh, uh, biennials and programs. What uh, is say? What can we change? Is, first of all, is this our job? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, and second, secondly, is this uh, for, uh, are we doing it only for our own hmm? people? We are always surrounded with, or uh, do we do it for uh, 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 the, yeah the larger for uh, for whatever it is, for democracy. So, and then, uh, and thinking about the, our topic here, l'exposition imaginaire, how, how can we spread the world and the, con yeah, how can we, how, how can we, where can we reach out to? This, I think it's very relevant, and, and also what you are 
talking about uh, and, and your concept about contour, I find it so uh, uh, important <laughs> and um, it's a very interesting um, uh, yeah, and politically I driven project. And I'm, I'm just wondering, yeah, go. Yeah. No, I, I understand also the sort of risks, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, because it, if one only looks at the immediate uh, present as though there isn't this kind of broader historical lens in which to understand um, the turmoil of the time. Mm -hmm. I, I think that can be quite flat, but I believe that you know, using small models also in a place that's not the mega city give, will give us time for reflection and Pondu has really always worked to bring in a very uh, diverse audience. This year we're going to be working with the City Festival, so we will have a lot of non-expert audiences. We're working with art schools, um, uh, we're working with you know, different groups, um, a youth center that mm -hmm. works with um, uh, uh, young people from immigrant backgrounds. You know, there's, there's a lot of scope, I believe, um, and I'm not pessimistic. No, I'm also not pessimistic, so, at all. Um, with Skype, with Skype uh, uh, conversations is always a bit uh, tricky to, to open up to the audience, but it would be very nice, uh, and I would like to ask the audience if there's any question. If there's any question from your side, because I'm, I'm looking here now to the audience. If not, yeah, we're going to have a very uh, dense program this afternoon, um, and it's exactly the time frame I was thinking we are talking to, uh, uh, to each other this afternoon. Natasha, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I will try and follow the rest of the conversations online. Yes, there will be now Dieter, Dieter Rolstrater, your colleague, and uh, followed by uh, Forrest Nash. Um, yeah. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.